Today, we're going to try and better understand what goes into making some amazing rocket and spaceflight images. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, as always, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. Just a quick reminder for you, the show notes and any links that we mentioned for today are available at the website at behindtheshot.tv. Just find this episode. I write a little bit about my guest. I've got all of the links that we mentioned there, a small sample gallery of his work as well. If you're watching on YouTube, head down below the like and subscribe button in the description area. You'll find any links that we mentioned, but not the entire blog post. For that, you got to run over to uh, behindtheshot.tv. And a quick reminder that on YouTube, down in the description area, I do have chapter markers. So skip around, jump around to whatever section of the show that you want. You don't have to sit through any part if that's not what you're looking for. Now, today's guest I want to bring in quick because I've known this guy for a while. He's been on the show before. We'll talk about that in a minute. Please welcome to the show rocket and spaceflight photojournalist, also an educator and a podcaster, Mr. Eric Kuna. Eric, how are you, buddy? Well, hey, Steve. How's it going? It's going really, really well. You have, I first met you when I left the TWIP network, Frederick Van Johnson's network, and mm -hmm. went out on my own, you were one of the first three shows. You were kind enough to be one of my first guests when I went out on my own. That was five years ago, 2018. Uh, oh, time flying, huh? It's so weird. When I looked back and went, 2018? What the hell, man? Uh, the show was called Shoot for the Skies. It was one of your rocket trail images. And... We have not seen each other really since. One time at Photoshop World, I saw you in a distance and I tried to catch you and I, and I didn't make it in time. What have you been up to since we last chatted? Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, great stuff, you know, obviously been uh, documenting and doing a lot of photojournalism in the space flight community, you know, documenting uh, all the stuff that's happening with a bunch of different companies, uh, SpaceX, um, uh, ULA, uh, Relativity, uh, Rocket Lab, and now uh, even uh, new ones coming on the scene like Stoke Space. So uh, just document a lot of that. Plus, you know, obviously I'm a big uh, night photographer, been doing a lot of that uh, and um, just having fun. And then we got Kelby One. We've got our training where we do uh, all training on Photoshop Lightroom photography. So we keep busy. Well, and, and I say you've been on the show before, but let's still, for those who don't know Eric Kuna, I kind of want to run through some of what you just said, do a, do a Eric at a glance type thing. You mentioned Kelby mm -hmm. one. So I tell people, I think I tweeted it the other day, something about you and, and Scott, because you just did a grid episode with Larry from Platypod and, and Jesse fire who was on the show with a, a star Wars shot. It was May the 4th and we had yeah. his show on, but I tell people all the time. And it's not just because I know you guys. Kelby one to me is the gold standard for online education. And don't misunderstand me. I don't have interest anywhere. There's a lot of great online education. I do some training for, for a, a different site, but Kelby one to me is, has always been the gold standard. What exactly do you do for Kelby? I know you teach classes for Kelby. You do the grid with Scott. What else do you do for Kelby? Well, uh, for Kelby, I, I work on the operation side of it. So everything from the marketing, the video production, the uh, books, magazines, um, the customer support, anything to do with the experience of Kelby One. That's really what I'm uh, I'm in charge of and and really help uh, uh, lead. Um, and as well as you know, with Scott and and others, you know, uh, we're just making great training and our big thing is to make it accessible and affordable for everybody so we're trying to make a great training that's really done in a way that's not um it's down to earth it's like we're talking to a friend you know that's really our style when we when we bring on instructors uh people that we tend to work with they're all people that we just want to help each other we just want to help other photographers and we don't want to overcomplicate things you know one thing in photography that tends to happen is we try to make a we make it, uh, it's like a uh, smoke and mirrors. So we try to, you know, but at the end of the day, if you strip that back, it's really not that difficult as long as you just tell people how to do it. So that's yeah, what we I, do. It's interesting. I see photographers sometimes approach photography like it's a magic trick. And mm -hmm. I've got this little secret sleight of hand mm -hmm. that I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what my aperture was. And it's like, really? Come on. Uh, 
you've got actually some of my favorite instructors there. Rick Salmon is there. Frederick mm -hmm. is doing classes now. Jefferson Graham, Joe McNally. The list goes on and on of who you have. But for, for your work stuff, you mentioned the SpaceX and the NASA type stuff. You've also worked for some big, more towards the creative photography side of things. You've worked with Adobe, Google, Canon, B&H Photos. And I did not know about this one. You've got workshops that you do with Jay, uh, Gra is it Graymond? Is that how he pronounces yep, his name? Yep. Yeah, Graymond. So tell yeah. me about Dakota Adventure. Yeah, so we're doing a, we do, um, well, like I said, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a night photographer is like my one thing that I do beyond, I'm a rocket photojournalist, but night photography is a big part of my life. I love night photography. I love space. You know, obviously it fits in. Uh, so we're doing a, yeah, we yeah. do a workshop every year. Um and we're doing it in the Dakotas. Uh, love, love going out there. It's a great part of the country. Um, in South Dakota, we're going over to the Badlands, and we're doing a workshop out there in the Badlands. Uh, all uh, this one is going to be interesting because I have the uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, we have uh, Russell Brown coming to this workshop as well oh. as being one of the co. And he is uh, he's. I mean, I love Russell. He is one of my like. Uh, inspirations when it comes to creativity and you know we were talking last year and he you know he loves you know we love each other's work and we're talking and he said to me like look at if you're going back if you're ever doing anything i'm there and i i called him up and i said well we're going back and he's like i'm there so uh we're coming we're gonna do some really cool we're doing a lot of light painting uh, a lot of like a lot of trying to do stuff in one exposure and what's great is it doesn't matter what device you have, what camera you have. In fact, uh, Russell and I, we shoot a lot of, with our phones. And I know Russell is going to bring mostly on the workshop his phone and do us a lot of stuff with our phone. Because once you really understand what photography is all about, the device kind of doesn't matter anymore. It kind of gets washed away. Um, so it's going to be cool. We're going to spend five days out there just really making great images, uh, getting creative with it and then doing all the post-processing and the best part about the workshop because not only is that it's the camaraderie and bringing everybody together and we have a great place to do that we're actually on a ranch a working farm uh but it's a great facility uh great room you know but the the breakfast oh my gosh the breakfast at this place is the best breakfast and there's nothing like after a shoot coming back and having an awesome breakfast and then again, awesome dinner as well. So food is very important to, to our workshops. The workshop is Dakota Adventure Light Painting Under the Stars. It's July 17 yep. to 21 of 2023, mm -hmm. depending on when you're watching this. You mentioned mm -hmm. Russell Brown. It's funny. Uh, Dave Williams, who does a whole bunch with, with Kelby One, mm -hmm. was up in Norway getting, you know, kind of pre-preparing for his workshop and doing his Due North series. And Russell Brown went up to the Lofoten Islands with him and it is shocking what that man does with a phone. I've never met him, but his Crazy. work is insane. People, if you don't know Russell Brown, go look him up. And I will have links for Dakota Adventure, Light Painting Under the Stars with, with Eric and, and Jay uh, in the show notes, BehindTheShot.tv or down on YouTube in, in, in the, in the uh, description. You know, thinking about your genre of photography, rockets, space flight, it's a very unique genre. I mean, you're not the only one that does it, but it's not like wedding photographers. There's not one on every corner every Saturday, right? I'm curious in your genre, what's the, uh, aside from the camera, I should probably start with, what's the gear you can't live without? Well, the 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 one piece of gear I can't live without is a way to trigger my camera. So um, it is very crucial when we're doing like remote setups and we're out at the launch pad. We can't be there. You know, obviously you can't be next to your camera when the rocket's going off. The camera's there. Uh, I call them uh, uh, autonomous robotic cameras, you know, where they're just like they're on their selves. Uh, they're all robotic. I've, I've all I've done is I've set them up. I've set up the framing. I've set up the exposure. I've set up all that stuff. And then it's just going to do a job. And its job is to listen for a loud sound because there's one thing you can guarantee every rocket to make, which is a loud sound. So it's just waiting for that rocket to go off, make that loud sound, and then it's triggering like crazy. And uh, I use actually a, a MyApps Smart trigger is what I use. It's MyApps Smart Plus. 
And that's how all my triggers now are my ops smart plus. I've been using them for years. I've actually never had one fail. In fact, I've got one right here uh, that um, it, uh, this is one that got cooked and you can see it's still like bent up and kind of burnt and all that. And that was wow. from a, um, a, a Stokes base, uh, their test flight that I was shooting it. Uh, the rocket actually burnt a lot of the camera, even though I had, um, it was all protected with uh, reflective uh, uh, shielding. Uh, metal shielding, it still melted it because I had, I, I didn't, there was this one little sliver that I didn't cover and then the heat got under there and totally melted it. But here's the thing, this MyOp still works. Even Re Are you all, serious? All melted up like that. That's how good they are. <laughs> you can burn them up and they'll still work. So, okay, I have two questions. I got to follow up on that then. A, what does something like that trigger run? Uh, well, I mean, battering on where the sales are and stuff, about 200 bucks. Okay, so that's not too bad. And it is, it's a sound trigger? Well, so it's not just a sound trigger. That's what's interesting. I use it just for sound, but this has modes for sound, lightning, time lapse, uh, uh, storm lapse. Uh, there's even modes to like single trigger or multiple triggers, delayed triggers. We can even uh, use them in conjunction. It's, it's so many things you could do. It's like the ultimate trigger for your camera that you can program you can program it through your phone you can program it through the interface it really doesn't matter so okay this is fascinating to me because i've never played with with that kind of a remote trigger so on the sound end rocket makes noise it can trigger can you program that let's say that you knew you wanted to catch the rocket after it had lifted, well, the noise comes before that. You don't necessarily want it triggering then. Can you program in when you hear a noise, wait 30 seconds, then shoot? Or is it when you, you hear it, it, it has to shoot? You can put a program into delay, but not that long of a delay. It's usually in milliseconds. And okay. a lot of times that's because uh, you might want the sound to be lagging. Uh, but really, honestly, for us, uh, if I wanted that shot, like you're talking about, that happens a lot where... I don't want the shot when it just lifts off. I want it to be about 10 seconds in. All you're doing is setting up your buffer to where it's not going to fill up. You know, a rocket actually doesn't okay. come off the pad that quick. You know, it seems like it's going to go quick, but it kind of like ramps up off the pad. So one or two frames a second might be plenty for a shot like that, where if I'm going for an engine shot, I might have it on continuous high. I'm shooting 12 frames per second or whatever the camera that I have out there is doing. So okay. a lot of times it's like that. Um, but now one thing that we can do with these is set up different modes or delays. For example, uh, one of the things I do here in Florida, like one of the, one of um, our problems here in Florida is more weather, right? We have uh, violent thunderstorms that'll come sometimes. And that's really where our, our cameras mostly get damaged is from weather. So we've got them protected. But what happens is thunder is pretty loud, right? So thunder will start triggering off your camera. So one of the things you can do with a MyOps uh, is you can set a delay. So I can say, well, the rocket's not set to launch for two days. Well, don't listen for a sound for two days. So that way it's oh. waiting two days before it actually triggers. So that's another thing you can do. And again, there's just so many things you can do with these things that start getting into this weird creativity and just just different items that you can think about, like how you can trigger off of just motion and lightning and different, different um, scenarios. And this is, this is going to happen the whole show, but you say a sentence and immediately my mind starts triggering. You set your cameras up on the launch pad some days, two, three days before a launch. Yeah. Uh, Artemis last year, we were five days before the launch. Wow. We were out there setting up. So we have to plan on our cameras sitting there for five plus days because rockets scrub. They're sometimes out there right. for longer than that. So, yeah, the Artemis launch, we were five days before setting up our. Now, it ended up being that scrubbed and then we got out there two days before on the next one. But it just matters on when the schedule can accommodate us and when the schedule can accommodate media being out there. How are you powering it then? So, uh, I mean, it's, A, it's going to go to sleep, but, you know, either way, you could lose enough battery depending on outside temperature and a bunch of other yeah. factors. Are, are you AC powering them? 
Mm, it matters. It matters. Uh, for most of the cameras, no. Uh, what I do is I, they all have battery grips on them. So now I've doubled up the capacity. I've got two high capacity batteries in that. That right there can stand on standby for, because I've tested these out because I do that. Because one of the things when you're in the business of like you have to deliver, you'll I'll be testing stuff out just around my home and saying, okay, I'm going to see how long this will last. And I've had it to where between the MyOps going in standby and the camera going in standby, two weeks I've had it go. So I can get it, I can stretch it to two weeks. Wow. 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 Yeah. So you, you showed the trigger being melted, which like, okay. So at a festival, when I'm photographing bands, I freak out if they throw liquid at me, right? You're putting it under a rocket engine. It's just, we live in different worlds. How often? Because my my cameras don't get burned at a at a show. How often does your gear end up damaged like that? I mean, can you assume almost every shoot you're going to end up with some piece of gear damaged? It's very rare that it actually gets damaged. Uh, very rare. Um, in certain cases, like in this case, I was planning for it to get damaged because I was sticking the camera underneath the test engine, twenty five feet away from it. I knew that it's going to get hot. It's going to be flames. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of heat that gets uh, put onto that. And that's why I put on that um, ablative kind of shielding uh, on the camera. It just, again, I just didn't cover that one area and it got under there and burn it up. Um, but the camera was fine. Like the, the Canon, it was a 5D Mark III. 5D Mark III was great. It was golden. Uh, the only other thing that happened was the trigger cable actually got shorted out because the trigger cable had melted and the wires had fused together from it being so hot. So then what happened is it just got in this infinite loop where it triggered the camera until the battery ran out. But I still got the shot and that's all that matters. As long as you got the shot, who cares? <laughs> it's, it's funny you mentioned you missed a little sliver with the with the you know protective coating. And the first thought that hit me was sunscreen. Like it's, the, it's yep. when you go to the beach and you, you put sunscreen on it, yep. you miss one little sliver that ends up with a second degree burn. Quick reminder for everybody, as you're watching this show or any show that I do here, if you're watching on YouTube specifically, this show is a podcast first and foremost. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. It's available in two different forms. You can get it in an audio only form. I mean, we're talking about a photo but you can get it in audio only. I do have people who tell me they listen when they're driving and they go look at the picture on the website. You can do that. It's over at, you know, behind the shot.tv. You can find all the photos and everything there to watch them. But it is also available wherever you get podcasts. If your podcast app supports video, you can get it in video uh, format in a podcast app as well. The video, of course, also is on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, head down, click like, click subscribe. You know the routine. Uh, you know you know how all of that YouTube stuff is done. I want to get into today's image. And today's image, Eric and I went back and forth on this, right? And which is what I do with all my guests. We go back and forth. We kind of pick images. And Eric came back to me and said, this one's got a really good story to it. And I want to start with the title because the title of this shot, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's what was in the, the data that you sent me, is Excitement Guaranteed. Yes, that was Excitement Guaranteed. Because, um, And the name comes from Elon Musk and, and SpaceX, basically in their press release. And, and when they were talking about the rocket is, uh, when they were talking about the countdown, there's different stages in the countdown. And at T0, they had, they had put in the line item, Excitement Guaranteed. You know, so it was just basically like the the play on the we we were all planning on this rocket not even clearing the pad. That actually uh, the the success for this mission was does it lift off and go past the pad the top of the pad? That is considered successful. So we were already going into it with man, something crazy is going to happen. So um, it really was. This was the moment that I think it all came together. Um, and it really was um, this, I mean, it just, it was, I could get into the story, but it really is like, it captures the the raw emotion of what was happening, I think for everybody at that moment, because the rocket, because of the flames and all the diversion, you could see all that cloud, you couldn't see the rocket when it was lifting off. It was all just smoke and then it just, appeared through the smoke out the top 
And uh, the kid that you see in the photo was actually sitting down and sitting down on the ground. He was he was down next to his dad. And the minute he saw that rocket come above that smoke and that flame, he popped up with just this just pure joy and pure excitement. And I'm I'm actually back. So I'm back about 100 yards from them zoomed oh. in with a telephoto lens so i've got a very telephoto lens i you know I, i'm out at about i want to say about 350 millimeters there um and then i'm down on the ground so i'm actually laying on the dunes in the sand like laying down uh you know popped up and just have the camera like like zoned in on them to get down at his level so again i could kind of get this framing i had this picture of you know the people in the front and then the rocket in the back. And I, I intentionally picked uh, this because I was like, you know, really one of the things that happens at launches anymore uh, and throughout the years that I've been covering them is adults tend to watch the launch. And actually you can kind of see if you look at the adults, uh, they all have their phones up or they have something in their hand and they're watching it through their phones. They're not absorbing. They're not absorbing it. They're not the present. They're kind of looking at a screen that's recording something. Um, and and I knew again with that that kids don't do that. Kids kids live in that moment. They're not they're not at that point. So I was like, you know, if I'm going to hedge my bet, I, I did profile and I profiled and I said, if I'm going to hedge my bet, I'm going to go after because these kids were dragging their dad along so i'm like okay they're excited they're ready to go you know um and it was funny because we ended up uh this this um photo ended up uh the weather channel ended up interviewing me and interviewing the family because we ended up finding the family and uh the the father had their kids sit down because there were so many photographers behind them he was afraid he was going his kids were going to get in the shots or ruin the shots so he's like, sit down, sit down. And, you know, I was like, no, 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 stand up, stand up. <laughs> but it was perfect. It just, it just everything aligns. And, and now that is part of photography. Part of photography is luck, right? Um, and, but you're setting yourself up for those lucky shots. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's funny that you, you, okay, so there's a couple things you mentioned. I told you this was going to yeah. happen the whole show. I knew this was going to happen the whole show. You mentioned that the dad wanted the kid to sit down. But the kid stood up. The dad was worried about the, the photographers. And you're going, no, 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 stand up. This shot right here behind me, that was basically the same type of a scenario. I'm photographing at a house of blues. And I'm way, I'm in the upper balcony. I've got a 7D, which is a crop sensor. I've got the 10 uh, millimeter lens on there. And the, the, the uh, EFS, what it, was it? 10 to 22 or something like that lens. I'm shooting at 10. I'm holding it up, trying to get the right angle. And suddenly this hand comes up. And actually it was the opposite in my mind. As the hand went up, I'm going, no, because I had it all framed. And then I chimped the back of the camera and I went up and showed the person and said, thank you. Because the, that, that, that weird accidental interruption kind of ended up making the shot. Now, for those of you on the audio feed, I'm going to describe this shot to you before we get into the technical exposure details. So the, as we kind of get into some of the detail stuff, you have a picture of it in your mind. This is a standard portrait orientation ratio type photo. I'm going to start in the distance. In the distance, separated from you by a body of water. Is that a, is that a river? What is that? That is the, the inlet, the jetty that goes into... Um basically Port Isabel. And that's, uh, we're looking at it from South Padre Island. So it's like a, it's like a jetty and inlet, you know, Okay, just a waterway. So separated from you by that inlet on the other side of that inlet, rolling green Hills, right? Far behind the Hills, a huge cloud set of clouds of gray smoke. It's not like white clouds, like in the sky, this is smoke coming out of, the ground and out of the top of the smoke against a pale blue sky is this dark rocket taking off its center top frame. It's prominent. It's got, 
you know, an exhaust trail behind it. And if you don't look close, you're going to miss that there was a bird in front of the smoke. It is so awesome when you really look close and you see the bird in some ways to me that kind of made the shot when I noticed that. The far shore of the water is like slabs of rock or concrete or something against the shore like a barrier so the water doesn't erode it. On your side of the water, you're like knee high in shrubs from, from the camera point of view. We know now that Eric was far away laying down, but it feels like you're knee high in shrubs and scattered around the ground are people. Okay, They're sitting there, some of them standing there watching the launch. There's chairs, there's blankets, there's adults, there's kids. The lower half, just right of center, is this one kid standing up, arms out, like greeting the world in excitement. And part of what makes this kid is he's wearing this like, you know, two-tone bathing suit and a t-shirt and this big floppy, I'm going to say military style <laughs> hat, but yeah, this big yeah. floppy hat as though his team just won the championship. I mean, it is so perfect of a moment. Did I did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, there's other things that are interesting. So his brother is sitting next to him, and you can see him cheering. He's clapping his hands, but he hasn't got up yet. And you can actually see the other thing is you'll notice the dad has his arm down, and he's he's I got his arm to his side. The dad is actually getting ready to stand up with his kid. You know, he felt the emotion from his kid. And, he, and so the next frames are him awkwardly standing up. So this this was a hard shot because this was the moment because the next frame, the dad looks awkward. The next frame, the dad looks awkward. The next frame, the dad looks awkward. So those wouldn't have been the frame because it wouldn't have, this one was the only one where everybody was in the perfect positions. Like the rocket was in the perfect position. The, the child was in the perfect position. The dad was in the perfect position. Uh, and then everybody else didn't move because like, like I said, Adults, when they're rocking, lock and locked, wa watching rocket launches, they tend anymore to kind of just lock in. And again, 90% of them have their phones on them, which is always kind of like a, amazing to me because there's so many people out there capturing these launches. There's so many uh, videographers, press professional photographers, there's webcasts and podcasts. And I know we all want to record things, but our cell phones are like at what? 12, uh, 24 millimeters, 35 millimeters. This rocket is a little blip. And, I mean, you got to think I'm at 350 millimeters and look at how small the rocket is. And that's a, for context there uh, to the viewers, that rocket is 5.5 miles away from me right now. Oh, seriously? So that, that, yeah, that rocket is 5.5 miles away. So that tells you scale, right? That um, it is 5.5 miles wow. away emerging from that smoke. Um, and that's where you get down to it. Like, like so many people don't experience it. So they never really see it because they're looking at their phones. And I always encourage people that are going to the launch, unless you're a professional photographer and you really are going to take photos, put the phones, put the cameras away and just enjoy it. Because I'm telling you, you'll get way more out of it uh, than just capturing the cell phone. I know people want the memories, but there's so many people capturing these memories you know, like go buy a print from one of these people, go download their video or something like like that's the way to do it. Because I, I tell people that all the time is like, enjoy it. It's, it's the same thing with like weddings, I feel like anymore. Like yeah. the people at weddings is like, put down your phones. There's a professional here taking the wedding photos. Put down your phone, people. I know. Just enjoy the moment. Live present in the moment. I see. It's the same so. at concerts. At concerts, oh, everybody yeah. with their phone. I mean, it's one thing if you're putting your phone up with a flashlight on because you're trying to, you know, simulate that yeah. you have a lighter from the old days. But so many people are just videotaping horrible, horrible phone video. We're taking mm -hmm. photos. I mean, granted, sometimes you get lucky and you get a good shot. But that band, that artist that you're a fan of is going to post some amazing stuff on their Instagram. Go look at those yeah. and say, I was there. And enjoy yeah. the show. You, you sent me some... Uh, some supporting images that were intriguing to me. This one you had labeled calm before the storm. Yes. Yes. That was them. That, so this is the moment, right? So this was the moment where we actually saw the ignition. So at this point, you got to realize that nobody 
I knew it was lifting off. Nobody there had really like, like absorbed the fact that it's launching yet. That was like the, and that's where the kid was, you know, the kids were down there. And within those few seconds, he had popped up into full on like amazing mode. You know, he was just like amazed. And, and you, you can see what's interesting. Like, look at the people next to him, like uh, hand around uh, the person. You've got the two people up front close to another. You've got the one guy who's got his tripod and the photography. This is very indicative to launches. And, you know, this is actually this frame to me is uh, also one that, What's interesting about exploring and space exploration to me, and especially the space exploration and the space community even, is that what I love about it is it's a community that is about, um, you know, it's, it's about looking beyond ourselves as humanity and looking to the future. So we tend not to get caught up in the crap that goes on in the world. Nobody's out there talking politics nobody's out there talking religion nobody's out there talking about all these things that divide us they're just like how cool is this you know uh, in fact this is one of this was actually the one of the best launches i've ever watched and been a part of and it was because of the people and in fact when i got there in the morning um uh, little side story kind of to get off to it but you know this launched on 420 right and you know we all know 420 you know there's a there's the, the 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 pot smoking reference, right? Well, I ended up going up to the dune where I was going to shoot near because I had scoped it out. And uh, I got up there and there's this music blare and there's like Pearl Jam blaring. And it's like, oh, this is kind of weird. And there's six like college students up there. And they're, they've been out there all night partying. And they're high as anything, right? They are just high. But I'm telling you what? the love that came from these these guys and the the admiration they had no inhibitions of like nobody it was just we are enjoying life we are present in the moment we are going to watch this cool thing that's happening and it was like nobody nobody's fighting and nobody's bickering and then 20 more people come around and then 30 more people come around and everybody's just having a good time and nobody's like arguing with one another and fighting with one another or doing any of that stuff, just really a, a very unifying thing. And that's what I love about it. You know, it's funny. You just struck, this doesn't happen very often. You just struck a memory from my youth. My dad was in the air force and for years was stationed at Vandenberg air force base where they mm -hmm. fire off a lot of missiles. And I used to, as a kid, get to go watch the launches. Later on in his career, right before he retired, he was at Davis Monthan Air Force Base, which is in Tucson, Arizona, which is a large area around there of where the underground ICBMs and stuff are. And he actually took us into one of the silos. And it was one of the strangest experiences as a teenager. I think it was probably 12 or 13. And we go into this silo and there's one room, he knocks on the door, and they open the door, Colonel Brazel, how are you? And we walk in and like that, you see everybody sitting at a screen in those days, reach up, grab a sheet of lead, pull it down and drop it down over their screens. And still to this day, I remember watching, you know, being around missiles and, and watching rocket launches. And it is so, it, it, it is such a special thing if you've never seen one before, it goes from this to this in no time at all. And it's so exciting. But, you know, one of the interesting things in this shot to me is I didn't realize that you could see that launch pad so clearly. Because in this shot, there is no launch pad. It's covered mm -hmm. by smoke. But when you look at this one, you really realize where that launch pad is and how big this all is again from, you know, five miles away. You sent me this one too on the pad. Is that the actual? So this is the pad. This is the pad that that is. And that's actually one of my remote cameras from the pad. Uh, this was from the scrub that happened. So it tr they tried to launch it on Monday, um, uh, that, that Monday. Um, and it didn't work out. Uh, and uh, a valve froze up and they had to, they had to go fix it. Uh, well, during that time, we had got our cameras back, you know, and this was one of the shots where, um, like, if you zoom in, there, there's a bunch of venting happening. 
And that venting was so loud that it triggered my camera. Well, that triggered the camera and then took this exposure. Um, and then what I do is I have my camera set up in, a, in an aperture priority mode for this because I'm not sure about the exposure. This, this rocket's never lifted off before in our lives. So we're not sure what the exposure is going to be. So, um, you know, and truthfully, I don't shoot in manual mode with this stuff uh, because of that. Um, and so I had it set and it triggered the exposure. It came out with a nice little night shot exposure, but that camera uh, no longer exists. Uh, that camera is uh, is gone. Uh, the The rocket was so powerful that that was uh, that camera was mounted to. Uh, and there's there's a shot of that's a shot from one of my cameras that survived of the barrage of rocks and debris flying at our cameras. It was almost like a shotgun shell. Or, you know, it's just a shotgun of of concrete that came out, and that shotgun of concrete came out. And where when I went to go pick up my camera, like one of my cameras was totally fine. The guy next to me, 10 feet away, his camera was blown back and in 20 pieces. It was wow. really like one of those like uh, roll of the dice. But our cameras that were inside the pad were mounted to a, a metal railing that was attached through anchors into the concrete. And that metal railing after the launch was no longer there. It, the metal railing had been ripped out of the ground and thrown back and was like way like, I want to say like from the aerial photos we had like 50 yard, fifty feet back from where it was. So it had blown it off and, and then all our cameras obviously were on that and got blown off as well and got uh, torn up. So our cameras did not survive. Uh, some of our cameras did not survive the launch. Interesting. So this shot, according to the EXIF data, was a Canon 7D Mark II yep. with a Tamron 150 to 600, great lens. I use mm -hmm. a Sigma version of basically the, the same lens. Aperture priority, auto mm -hmm. white balance, matrix mm -hmm. metering, and your mm -hmm. exposure is fascinating to me. I mean, I think I get it. Mm -hmm. ISO 100, it's obviously, you know, midday. Shutter of 1 250th and aperture F11. What, what are those unique challenges that made you choose F11, because if you're in aperture priority mode, shutter got set automatically. Yep, yep. Did you know when you chose F11 that it wasn't going to accidentally drop down to 1 60th? How confident were you of that? Yeah, um, I know that, you know, at F11, I'm going to get a, I'm going to meter something around that exposure. Um, uh, I really needed to be over 1 1 25th of a second to really like freeze the rocket that far away. Uh, so I knew it would be over that. And the, the reason I picked F11 is because I wanted the, the, the foreground, the, the child, to be a little bit out of focus, but not so out of focus that it was, like, if I dropped that down to F5.6, he'd be so out of focus, almost feel too blurry, right? Because, right? again, we're talking five miles. We're, we're, that's a long way. But I wanted that rocket to be super sharp. So I wanted the rocket to be sharp and then fall back away. Which this is that's this is typically not how I shoot. I usually shoot where the foreground is in focus and the background is out of focus. But this was one of those shots where I knew and I locked in and committed to it. Like I that was all in on this photo. If this kid like just sat down and was boring, I was done. Like this photo would not have happened. But it was making that conscious decision of I want him, I want the people in the foreground to be a little bit out of focus, not completely sharp but I don't want to be so out of focus that it just looks wrong. So that's why I picked F11, because it tends to be a, a, a good balance between letting in enough light so I get enough uh, that stopping power with that uh, shutter speed, but not creating that shallow, shallow depth of field to where I would just have like kind of like, like, like the kid would have become a lot blurrier then. Well, and again, 7D Mark II is a crop sensor. So that mm -hmm. even helps with the with the F11. And I love mm -hmm. the fact that you were thinking of that at the time, right? A lot of people would accidentally get that. They would focus on that rocket, shallower depth of field. They'd get the kid. They'd still love the shot because the kid was up in the air. But having the mental wherewithal to, to uh, storyboard, for lack of a better phrase, in your mind, what you wanted, that you didn't just want foreground to set the rocket up but you actually wanted a foreground subject, intentional foreground subject. I love that. 
But it's interesting because you make the comment that if he didn't go up, you were done, right? I mean, that was the plan. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I would argue there are two completely independent shots here, which is what makes it so strong. You've got at the top of the shot, if you were to cut this right here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. At the top of the shot, you've got a horizontal rocket launch. Yeah. And it's a yeah. hell of a rocket launch shot. Below that, if you, you know, just went a little bit higher, this could easily be any shot where this kid is just celebrating and the kid could be the subject. I mean, there is a lot of possibility here from a composition point of view, the celebration versus the, the, the rocket launch. But here's one of the things I noticed as I was kind of dissecting this shot. The rocket's not straight. So the mm -hmm. rocket's at a little bit of an angle. And that rocket, almost like you've got a leading line, is perfectly in line with the shape and, and angle that the boy is at. And, you know, accidental or not, that's the stuff to me that makes just amazing shots is the way that the, the foreground subject and the background subject connect together, the energy of, of all of it. So question for you on lighting. This is, according to EXIF data, this is like 1040 in the morning. Yeah. Not the perfect time for outdoor light, right? It's not midday, mm -hmm. but still. Do you even think about that, considering that you have no control over it anyway? Um, I think a little bit about it. That's why I tend to like this shot. I, I underexpose a little bit uh, because, again, I want to I want more stopping power. And that's why I would tend to to, to underexpose uh, in metering. Like if I'm going to meter, I'd underexpose the metering. Um, but really, at the end of the day, like with rocket launches, they just never consult us on the on the launch time for some reason. They just never say, hey, what would be awesome for photographers, you know, for this? But uh, I would love for them to do that, but they tend not to do that. So we kind of have to just roll with the punches. So with that, I was really looking more at, I just want a good exposed frame. And I'm looking more at the composition and the moment. And that's what I'm focused on. You know, that's why, again, I have my camera in aperture priority. I've got the focus locked in on the rocket because I don't want to have to think about anything, but I was looking at, okay, keep the kid and keep the rocket in the shot and balanced and keep it balanced and keep the frame looking good as he's moving and just snapping away, you know, and just getting those moments. And, and that's where, for me, I find that that's a, a great way for me to shoot is to, to really lock in, like, what are the important things about this shot? And the important things I knew would be about the shot is that moment. It would be just, I mean, that'd be, it'd be all about that moment. So I'm just waiting for that moment. And then I'm just keeping my composition. But like I was saying, I was way down on the ground because if I was standing up, him and the rocket, they would have separated more. And I wanted to get as low as I could to keep him and the rocket closer to one another. So it really did. I mean, I, I wish I had a picture of it because I, I had to look like the silliest person on the beach because everybody's standing up. Everybody's like full on. And I'm the one guy who's like laying down and I'm like really low to the ground. I'm like, lay, I think I had sand in my hair. It was ridiculous. But shooting, but shooting with intention like that, right? Being mm -hmm. aware. So you said you wanted a good exposure and focus more on composition. Being aware of that, right? being aware of the story you want to tell. That's where the art of photography to me comes in. The fact that this boy's hat doesn't actually even touch the shore is against the water. That mm -hmm. in and of itself is fantastic to me. Now this crop, you could have done this crop a million different ways. Do you crop your images usually, or do you, whatever frame is in camera you stay with? Um, I, I'll crop a little bit, but I try to get it as close. Like this is not really cropped at all. I mean, that's, that's the frame. But again, it's because if I have the intention, if I've had a shot in my head, um, I tend not to crop because I'm looking at the frame and I'm, I'm just making the frame in my head. Um, I tend to crop more when I just couldn't get the frame. I, you know, like, like I can, if I can get close and then I'd be like, okay, I'm going to crop from here. But, you know, you're always trying to, as a photographer, like, hey, the closer I can get it right in the camera, the better, you know? So that's that's really when it comes down to that is I will crop anytime I have to 
but I won't crop if it's what was intended. Makes total sense. But but when you do get into post, crop or not crop, mm -hmm. how much post do you do to a shot? Like, for example, what is what is your standard post processing? Well, for, for photo photojournalism shots, I am just doing the basic adjustments. So for this, I was just doing like, I guess you'd say the basic panel in uh, in Lightroom. And that's where White this balance, edit was done. Exposure, yeah. dodging and burning, yeah, that so type of thing. It's, it's like uh, contrast adjustments, brightness adjustments, you know, basic adjustments. Because this photo too, um, you know, by the time I shot it to the time it went over to my agency, it's a half an hour. So I don't have but a few minutes to edit. I don't have like oh. days to edit because I got to get the photo out, you know, because again, it's old. It's old news if I don't get the photo out. So, I mean, I, this was this was sent over within 30 minutes. That's fascinating to me. I did not realize. So one of the things I love about what we both do is that photojournalism connection, right? You traditional photojournalism, you have journalistic integrity ethics issues that come involved basic you know white balance crop exposure adjustment dodge burn that's about it that's all you're going to do because yeah. you, you can't clone stuff out or anything i love that but you could take this same image and you do you sell prints you could take this same image if you wanted to completely separate from your client base process the heck out of it turn it into fine art and sell it. The same shot can be used two different ways, which I, which I love. And again, I've got a link to to Eric's uh, print shop in in the show notes at behindtheshot.tv. Are there any apps you can't live without? Uh, well, a uh, couple that I can think of. Well, Lightroom. It's my life. Uh, I love Lightroom, especially for this photojournalism, doing stuff quick. Uh, Lightroom, and that's my life because that's where I can go through, make my selects, make my quick edits, export them, upload them. They're done. Um, uh, Photoshop obviously is an extension of that. But um, like you said, I don't tend to use that uh, when I'm doing photojournalism because I just don't have the time. Uh, but to your point, when I have the time, I can go back. And that's what's so great about these shots is I could take these shots and then make art out of them. You know, I could take the shot and make art out of it. Now, with this one, I've kept it kind of clean. I mean, there's things that are like uh, that bug me about this shot that like I could take out. Like, for example, there's a guy who's over on the right that's just peering into the frame. I could take him out. There's a the, leg the half white shirt of a guy. Man. Yeah. Yeah. There's a leg of a guy in a chair that's sitting down that I could definitely take out. But again, for the photojournalism shot, I'm not touching that. Right. But I could for, for my shot. But um, there's Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, I would say another, uh, there's a couple other apps that I really rely on. Um, PhotoPills is a big one. You know, I'm always using PhotoPills. Of course, I'm a night photographer, so the Milky Way, it's kind of essential. Um, for rocket launches, there's an app uh, online called... Um, flightclub.io and that's an essential uh, uh app for us and what that does is it shows us rocket trajectories and it can show us rocket trajectories in with coordinates and then can show us frames so we can plan out shots like um i want a rocket streak that's going across the frame from this gps coordinate and then it'll show me hey i've got this sensor i've got this lens i've got this um uh, this location, and it'll show you like a two dimensional frame of how that would look overlaid off the top of like a Google Maps, you know. So it's really cool. And um, for for you know, planning those shots, so that's another one. Um, and then there's some weather apps that I use a lot, but you know, those are those are tend to be the apps I can't live without. Um, there's one uh, that I use a lot called Astrospheric. Um, that's a night one that I use all the time, but I use it for these type of shops as well. Cause I knew that morning that it would be very hazy, uh, from that app. I knew that it would be very hazy. You know, there's a lot of haze that I have to cut through, which is another reason why under exposure, I wanted to cut through that haze, a faster shutter speed and under exposure will cut through haze a little better. So. Interesting. Yeah. So the one app you didn't mention, I really thought that you would photo mechanic. 
Yeah. Well. That's interesting to me. All yeah. right. Again, you know what it is? I'm just so such a Lightroom person. I've used Photo Mechanic. I'm just I'm such a Lightroom person that I'm I'm quicker with it. <laughs> and yeah. that's just because you know it. You know it. So you're like, hey, you know. Well, again, this image is everything I want in a rocket image because it reminds me of being a kid with my dad at Vandenberg watching launches. This one brought back memories to me. I want to switch switch gears a little bit. Amazing shot. Thank you so much for sharing that. Switching to a speed round. I'm going to ask you some questions. Answer whatever comes to your mind first. Your top photography tip. Don't get caught up on the gear. Oh, that's a good one. And nobody has ever said that one. I like that one. Okay. Biggest photo. Yeah. Biggest photo mistake you made or almost made. Biggest photo mistake you made or almost made. Um, It would be uh, going out and not having like a battery or not having a card. I I don't do that anymore because you make that mistake once and it's done. So favorite composition rule if you have one. Oh, um, I love the rule of thirds. I mean, it's just like, it's definitely when you're starting out, if you could just, the rule of thirds would take people's photography and change it a lot because just understanding the rule of thirds really changes things. The rule of thirds is the one that I don't think about now. I do self-consciously yes, you do. and, you know, completely without thought, but I'll pull up shots and, and I'll realize that works because it's the rule of thirds. Favorite source of inspiration. Favorite source of inspiration. Um, You know, honestly, this is where I do think that um, Instagram and things like that, I really love to like look at other people's work. And that's one of my favorite sources. That's why I I think the internet's a a great and a a great and a terrible thing all at once. But uh, that's where I do love Instagram for that. Favorite band or performer? Oh, favorite band. Our performer. See, this is the thing. I'm, I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan. Big Led yes. Zeppelin fan. Okay. So that right there is Robert Plant. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Big Zepp fan. Big Zepp fan. Favorite drink? Uh, you know, Diet Coke. <laughs> it's not going to be alcoholic. Diet Coke. Yeah. Perfect. God, we have a lot of like, uh, a lot in common. Favorite movie or TV show? Ooh, movie or TV show? Um, you know, uh, this is a hard one. Uh, I I love The Big Bang Theory. It's one of my favorite shows ever. It just has all that elements that I like. Okay. In honor of Scott Kelby, your favorite chicken sandwich? Oh, Absolutely, hands down, it's the Aussie Grill, which is a chain by Outback. Uh, they have a sriracha chicken sandwich that is absolutely amazing. Amazing. You know, in my head, you were going to say, oh, yeah, you know, Scott keeps track of that. I should have known you would have one as well. Oh, Last no. question. We talk about it a lot. We talk about it a lot. He wrote a whole blog post on the best chicken sandwiches. He did. And all it made me want to do is try each and every one of them because scott has that way of writing that's so oh he does right i mean it's just amazing last question is there any photographer out there that you think more people should know about so i will say this i have a friend who is a rocket photographer uh his name is john kraus and i i know a lot of people do know about him but people who don't know about him um we we always are trading back and forth, like helping each other out and inspiring each other. But he always is coming up with something that I go, wow, that's so cool. It's just very, he's, he's got a great eye and he's young. And, you know, and I was like, you're, you're set, man. I'm like, it took me 40 some years to get to this point. You're in your twenties. Like you're set. Just keep it so, up. I will have links to his website, Instagram, whatever I can find in the yep. uh, show notes at behindtheshot.tv. And if people want to find you, uh, connect with Eric, what's your what's your main website? So everything's my name. So E-R-I-K-K-U-N-A. So that's ericuna.com. 
And then on social, same thing, at Eric Kuna on everything. I just, uh, nobody else has that name while I say that. There is a Polish bowler or some kind of lawn bowler, a uh, professional bowler or something that has that name too. And that's, it, I, I don't know if we're related. I haven't tried to reach out to him because that's actually where my family's from originally. So I'm guessing there's something that links back to that. And then I, I would be remiss if we did not include kelby1.com. Mm -hmm. Is Scott still doing a new class every month? Uh, we do a new class every week. Every so week. We do a, a new class every week. So we have every week. Uh, in fact, this week's class is very interesting because it's a totally detraction from what we normally do in that uh, one of our landscape photographers has got into AI and got into AI with uh, photography and then like taking and making like photorealistic images. So he's showing people how to use mid-journey and Photoshop and combine these two things to make these photorealistic AI images, which is really cool. Yeah, it, amazing. And we were talking in the green room, or maybe it was earlier in the show, and I just have gotten lost in other stuff. Uh, I think it was at the start of the show we mentioned that you had been on, might have been in the green room, that you had been on Frederick Van Johnson's show this week mm -hmm. in photo photography, TWIP, uh, talking about AI. So people should go look up that episode mm -hmm. as well. And then, of course, The Grid. Tell people, for those that don't know about The Grid, and I, I tweeted this the other day because I truly believe this. There's something about The Grid that when you watch it, it's one of those rare instances of online content where you guys really do make it feel like, even though you're at a desk with microphones in your face, you make it feel like we're all sitting around a coffee table. There's this That's looseness and glad. funness that is so hard to create. For those that don't know the grid, give give the helicopter yeah. view. Yeah, so it's a show we've been doing for a long time. It's been over, uh, it's almost a decade now. And uh, it's it's uh, designed to be, a, we decided in the beginning and how it is still to today, where it's a, a show where we're just talking about photography. Um, you know, spending an hour and sometimes a longer than an hour, uh, just like this week we had, we went way over. We always joke around like the network's going to cancel us one day, but uh, we're our own network. So I don't think that'll ever happen, but um, it's just about photography. So that, but that I'm glad that comes away that uh, comes across that way. Cause that's really our style is we want to talk to you. Like you're just like, we were talking and sitting around the table, just like we were friends and friends talking because we all are friends. We have a common, we're friends in photography. We all have a common goal, a common thing right. of photography and that's who's listening to that. And we uh, we do a lot, we do stuff to just give back on the show. Uh, we do uh, an episode every month where we do blind photo critiques. So it's just like people submit their images and we're just trying to help them. And it's been a very successful uh, segment for us because from that, we've had people that have started out uh i've had people run through the gamut of emotions with critiques i had a, I had a guy like years ago who afterwards was like you guys are all wrong this is i can't believe you talk about it. and then and then two months later he wrote me back and said hey i took your advice and stepped back from it and maybe you guys weren't wrong and i'm gonna go try it and then like six months later he contacts and like hey, I really appreciate what you did on the blind photo critique six months ago because it changed my photography. So it's like they run through this gamut of emotions. But if you're open to it, you know, hearing from other photographers who have done this day in and day out to say, hey, uh, this part of your image is not, you know, or this isn't working or, or there's people that we have to say like, hey, photography might not be your thing. You know, or you might want to look at like, but we're trying to help people constantly, you know, right. and that's all it's about. And that's what the show's about is helping people bringing, uh, bringing interesting topics uh, up to them. Like this week we had a, a Navy SEAL on, the, a retired Navy I SEAL. I know Darren. I know there. Darren. Darren's yeah. been on this show. Yeah. So Darren, we're talking to Darren and, uh, you know, just incredible work, but just exposing people to all these different things. Uh, that they normally wouldn't see as photographers. And uh, so it's just a it's just a really cool, fun, like you said, casual show. Um, it really is us, too. That's that's us. That's raw. A lot of people ask me all the time, like, is that how Scott really is? And I'm like, 
that's exactly it. A lot of people, it can be an act. You know that it can be an yeah. act. It can be it's like we're, but this is us. This is like I'm talking. This is me. I mean, this is who we are, and I'm not trying to put on any act or any show. And this is what we do. You know, it comes across, and it's funny because. I've judged image comps and stuff like that. And I started doing a, an image critique show here with my buddy, Don Komarechka. You know, Don, don't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So Don and I, for two years, did image critique shows once a month here. And Scott, at one point, wrote a blog post on how you're going to get the most out of an image critique. Because I've told people for years, I believe, for me, one of the ways that you are going to improve in your photography the fastest is getting honest, not, hey, good shot, honest, fair critique from a trusted source. The trusted source part is actually key. It's got to be somebody who, you know, can see what your vision is and not just say, I would shoot it like this. Well, I'm not you, right? It's the ability to understand everybody has their own artistic voice, but what will take an image and make it stronger? And I think it's one of the best ways for, for you to improve quickly is, is good, strong critique. And Scott wrote this blog post that I share with people on a very regular basis. I used to give out that link every time I did a show with Don because it's one of the best articles you'll ever read. And Scott's one of the best at critiquing images. He's actually kind of, I, I told him this once, he's, he's one of the rare people I've met that is literally a born educator. I had the, mm -hmm. the extreme yes. pleasure of walking... Uh, the NAM show in Anaheim, the NAM show floor with him one afternoon, the whole afternoon, it was a blast, but just a born freaking educator. It's absolutely amazing. Eric, you've got prints, you've got workshops. I will have those links in the blog post. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to leave with people on where they can find you? No, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, if you want to follow stuff that we're doing here, uh, Super Clusters, the agency, they're out of New York. It's a, a division of A24 Studios, uh, do a lot of different films and stuff when we're in the space um, um, area. If you want to follow them, uh, you'll see a lot of my work. Uh, we have an app. Uh, lets you, uh, the app allows you to track like when launches are going off, uh, all that. So if you're ever wondering like, hey, is there a launch going off? I like to tell people if you're coming to Florida or if you're coming to California, check if there's a launch going off because Vandenberg and um, the Cape and now even uh, up there at uh, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, which is in uh, Virginia. Uh, and then also now in Starbase, like you can track all these things because it is just cool if you're in one of those areas uh, to see it. But yeah, I mean, anything they could do to support creators, uh, we are one of those things where we're we're doing this and we're having to, like we talked about, I'm having to sacrifice cameras and put them out there and they're 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 dying, you know, and they're getting blown up. Uh, anything you can do to support creators, but the way you support us, uh, I always like to say, is um, buying uh, stuff from uh, stuff we do, prints. Anything you can do to support us helps us make more of these images. Right. That's really what it comes down to. So anything you can do to support us. And that's why I always like to say, like, hey, if you may ask me, how can I support you? I say, buy a print because you get something out of it. I get something out of it. And the world gets something out of it because we've got that print forever. It, it's kind of like people who don't want to pay for apps anymore because apps have become so commoditized and so cheap. But the truth mm -hmm. is, if you want that developer to be able to feed their family and yep. continue to make improvements to that app, you got to support them in some way yep. or another. So if, if there is a creative out there that you like, not just you know Eric's work, but do Eric's work, but if there is a creative out there that speaks to you, find a way to support them. Cannot oh, recommend that one enough. Oh, that happened to me just this week. Uh, I had a, a somebody who saw the story, saw the, you know, if anybody wants to do this as well, they're more welcome to saw the story and said, Hey, I got an old 5d Mark four. I'm not using, you want to blow that up? And I went, yeah, I'll blow that up. And he sent it to me. Well, now I've got, now I'm down, only down one camera because I, I got one camera back. So there you go. So, yeah. I mean, the, but that's a, that's a great way to support it. He's like, it's just sitting on the shelf and it's not doing anything. So I might as well send it to do something cool with it than sitting on the shelf. So if you got any old cameras, send them my way. I'll blow them up. I'll blow them up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, send them all his way with a note. It's funny because I was at uh, NAB this past month, a month or so ago, and I met a YouTuber who I've watched a ton of. 
And I met him through a thing Photo Joseph was doing, a, a, a creator's dinner and, and after party. And I met this guy and I was really excited to meet him. And we talked for a little bit. And this guy has a bunch of Final Cut Pro plugins and he gave them to me. He sent me a link for him. I liked them so much. I still went and bought them. Yes. Yeah. Because I want him to create more. Right. 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 So, Support people that you like. Uh, again, Eric, thank you yeah. so much for doing this, buddy. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. It is absolutely my pleasure. Make sure that you go check him out. All the links are in the show notes at the website, behindtheshot.tv. I'll have his photographer pick, any of the apps that he mentioned. I will get all of those links from him and make sure that those are over there as well. If you're watching on YouTube, head down to the description area. All the links that we discussed are down below the like and subscribe button. You can do that down there. Once again, thank you to my guest this time around, Mr. Eric Kuna, one of the best that there is in the business. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. <laughs>